Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we started Donut. We're about a two-year-old startup, um, and one of the key ingredients to us from the beginning is how we talked and learned from our customers. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, so first, just a little bit about me. Um, before founding Donut, I was VP product at uh, a couple other startups. I also teach a course at Brown on uh, customer development and uh, kind of lean startup methodologies. So in terms of um, myself and the co-founding team, why we started this company, sort of the inspiration, we've all been doing startups for um, many years and have all kind of been through the cycle of the early days when it's a really small, tight-knit team you know everybody, and you're all kind of working hand in hand. But then you kind of hit a size, I don't know, maybe 50 or so, where things get, a, roles get a little ambiguous, things get a little murkier, and you kind of start to feel those growing pains. And then you really explode, and all of a sudden the sales team hates the engineering team, and you're not really sure what this person does, and why that team gets this offsite and the other team doesn't. Um, and we really felt like there were a lack of tools available for leaders to help build and foster their internal company culture. Uh, so what really we set out to do was can we build a company around helping leaders and people teams create great internal company culture. Uh, but that's a pretty like, big, broad idea and also pretty vague. Like what, what does that mean? What do we even do? Um, so how did, how did we start going about this? Um, we leaned on, on two different methodologies that are, that are pretty similar, and I'm sure many of you in this room are familiar with design thinking and customer development. Um, I'm not gonna dive deep into either one of those um, because I'm guessing there's experts in the room and you, you can read um, a ton of material online about them, but here's Stanford's version of what uh, design thinking looks like. Uh, this is Steve Blank's version. You can tell this one was not made by a designer. Um, and then there's a million other if you, if you Google all these methodologies. And there's increasingly complex, and some of them are probably over my head at this point. Um, but the way I sort of think about what we did and the process we used is actually much simpler. Sort of two really key ingredients. We talked to customers, and we made stuff. And then we just went through that loop as fast as we possibly could. Um, so I'm gonna share a little bit about kind of how we went on that really early part of the journey and, and what we learned. Uh, so in the first couple months of the company, we talked to hundreds of people. And on day one, we basically talked with anybody who had a pulse and had a job and asked them, what does company culture mean to you? What works great at your company? What doesn't work great? And from there, we start to see some patterns, start to focus in on certain problems. One of the things we noticed was there's kind of a cultural tipping point in terms of company size. You sort of reach this threshold that I sort of described earlier uh, where you don't have that sort of tight-knit feeling. You don't all know each other anymore. And we actually saw a lot of companies trying to run programs to help with this, to help maintain the good old days. Um, we saw hackathon projects building things that would kind of match you with lunch groups or go out to coffee. Uh, we see, saw people with spreadsheets that were trying to help facilitate connections across departments or doing buddy systems and mentor programs. Um, so we, we kind of heard all of that and we also saw in parallel that teams that were using Slack, really a lot of culture was living on Slack because it's such an expressive platform with emojis and GIFs, and we thought this would be a great opportunity to kind of marry the concept of helping people meet each other within their company and doing so on Slack. So we built our first prototype, which looked like this. Uh, we actually built dozens of prototypes for a bunch of different ideas. I'm not gonna show all of them to you, but the idea behind this was a Slack bot that would basically run a coffee or lunch roulette program within your company by matching you up with somebody you don't know opening up a direct message and telling you to go out and get coffee or lunch. Now, before we wrote a line of code to build this, we took this prototype back out to customers along with a dozen or so others and got feedback from people. And before we started building, we actually made sure we had a short list of companies that were eager and ready to try it the moment it was ready. Um, actually, by coincidence, the, the very first company that agreed to try it and use it is uh, 
uh, represented by one of the speakers tonight. Um, so happy to and kind of honored to share the stage with, with them. Um, but then after the paper prototyping stage, we actually built our first functional version of it. And it looks pretty similar, but there were, again, a lot of things we were testing with our customers about, you know, could Donut check in and see if you met, and how could we enroll people in this program? And the way it ended up working is you create a channel uh, for Donut. In this example, it's called Coffee Buddies. Everybody who's in that channel simply gets enrolled in the Coffee Roulette program, and then Donut automatically pairs you up like this. To give you a feel for how it evolved and how we went from nothing to then paper to then one company to then hundreds of companies, um, I'll show you kind of the first six months of Donut's lifetime. As I said, we started with those kind of hundreds of, of interviews and conversations, and then within a month we had paper prototypes we were testing with, with customers, and then that, that first uh, pilot with our friends at, at Stripe. Um, and then over the summer, we got five or 10 companies on it in a very controlled way. So we could spend a lot of time talking to them, learning what was working, what wasn't working, refining how the product worked. And when we finally felt like we, we kind of landed on something, we then launched it. We put it on Product Hunt, we put it in the Slack app directory, and then within a month, we had 100 more companies using the product. That's sort of like the, the initial creation story of how the first piece of Donut came about. Now we, we do more and we learned a lot more than that in those early conversations. Um, but one other thing that happened in that summer period actually, and a question that I get a lot is, why are you called Donut? Um, and we actually, we didn't pick that name on day one. We weren't even really sure what we were gonna build. We were gonna do something with, with culture. Um, we actually applied that same loop, talk to customers and make stuff to our company name. And actually when our first pilot customer started using it, it wasn't called Donut, it was called something else. In terms of naming companies or products for that matter, I sort of have a few check boxes I like to fill. One, it should be short, memorable, easy to spell, easy to pronounce, and maybe relevant. I actually think you can get away with injecting meaning into something that's not necessarily relevant to what you're doing. And I sort of, at my last company, had a little bit of an aha about applying user testing methodologies to naming. I worked for a company called Sukasa, and we were doing a lot of product iteration, and we were using usertesting.com, and you know, we'd watch the video, I'm sure many of you used, used usertesting.com, but if you hadn't, you basically give someone a little task to do, and they screen record, and you get an audio of them talking through it. And uh, it was supposed to be pronounced Sukasa, but every time we watched the usertesting.com video, it was, okay, I'm going to suska.com, I'm going to Sukusa. Well, that's kind of a cute name, it's Suska. Okay. Um, so when, we, when it was time to name Donut, um, actually, before we were really ready to name it, we were um, applying to a program called Friends of eBay, um, which is a, for really early stage startups here in New York. And so we needed to apply with a name. We didn't have a company name yet. So we just picked something that met the first few criteria. We picked Gobi. Didn't really mean anything to us. Um, and it sort of met all of those things, but actually it, it helped me add a number six to the, to the list, which is that you should probably make sure it's not vulgar in another country. Um, I'm not going to, I'm going to let you go Google that. But uh, if, if anybody's from Australia, then, then you may know what it is. But anyway, we learned that. So Gobi was out. Um, but then we, we did a brainstorm and, and came up with a short list of, of company um, candidates for company names. And then we went out and actually user tested Donut. And we did that by, at the end of our normal kind of need finding customer discovery interviews, once someone had all the context around uh, what we were doing and they were the right persona for our company, we just ran the short list the same way you might test multiple prototypes in a row. We tested multiple company names in a row. And of course, people told us what they thought, but just like user testing a product, just as importantly, we were looking at their body language. How did they respond to the name? What was their emotional response to it? And uniformly, Donut just kind of made people smile and laugh. And you know, we're building a product supposed to make people happy at work. So we wanted our name to, to do that as well. So we really think about this process as applying to anything that we make and do, whether it's the software product, whether it's the name of our company, whether it's um, really anything. Um, and the making stuff, you can kind of fill in whatever that is. So fast forward a little bit, um, because 
you know, this isn't what we did to start the company. This is also how we continue to run the company. Uh, once that first product that I described was out there, we continued to talk to our customers and learn from what they were doing with it. And, you know, we sort of had this one customer archetype in mind, the company that was maybe hit 100 employees and needed people to have lunch and coffee. Then people started doing really interesting things that helped them continue to inspire the product. So one thing is teams started taking selfies on their donut outings and reposting them in the Slack channel. So now instead of it just being a point-to-point -point connection, there was sort of this flywheel effect of people then sharing what they had learned and what they had done. And then we started recommending to teams that they do that. Um, I forget which team was the, the first to do that, the first with that brilliant idea. Um, but actually many just on their own started, started doing it. Um, another thing is uh, we had sort of thought of it as an in-person meeting, but companies like Envision that are fully remote started using Donut to facilitate people that had actually never met in person because they all work from home uh, to just do a video call and actually get to know somebody else. So that influenced the way we make the introduction. We actually, initially it was more rigid and suggested coffee or lunch and people would complain, well, wait, we can't do that. Um, so that influenced how we kind of do that. And finally, I sort of mentioned that the way you set Donut up is you make a channel just for Donut and you can call that whatever you want. So that's actually a pretty big clue into what folks are doing with the tool. All of these are actual donut channel names from our customers, and Coffee Buddies is probably the most popular. But to our surprise, we started seeing things like Code Pals and sales certification. So there's a sales team somewhere that actually matches up account executives on their sales team to practice their sales pitch, and practice their demo, and certify that you know they're ready, ready to pitch. Um, so again, sort of broaden the use cases and the way Donut can be used and then the way we think about building the product. Uh, going forward from all of that, once you have this sort of sea of inbound feedback, one really important thing that we always think about is just being really deliberate in what we invest in. You know, we need to think about our roadmap, we need to think about where the product is going, and there's way too many different use cases for us to cater our product exactly um, to what everybody needs. And that sort of goes back to the beginning of the process we didn't ask one company what they need and build that as a pilot. We asked hundreds to kind of triangulate a pattern and then start the pilot with one and, and kind of build from there. Um, so that's all I've got for you. Um, thanks for listening to that kind of story there. Uh, and I, I think we have time for questions. Dan, thank you very much. And we... We absolutely have time for questions. So the first one I have for you is actually on the user interviews. So I find it fascinating that you went out there and talked to a bunch of, over 100, I think, potential customers with paper prototypes. Yeah. Um, what did you learn about how to conduct one of those interviews properly to get the best input from people? That's kind of the first part of the question. The second is, how do you ding distinguish between like, hey, yeah, that sounds cool, and hey, yeah, I would pay you for that? Yeah. Um, and there's actually an intermediate one. There's, there's, hey, it sounds cool, I will use it, like tomorrow if it's ready, and then there's I will pay. So, because um, even the it sounds cool, sometimes you, they're still not gonna try it. So one thing I would say is that the kind of recipe for an effective interview changes over time, depending on how much we've learned and how much we can therefore predict about the persona that we're gonna go talk to. So in the early days, it was really, really broad and wide. I mean, we were asking seemingly kind of like stupid questions. They were so kind of ignorant. And then just asking why five times after that, just to really understand what was making people tick. Once we had kind of understood kind of some company archetypes and who the roles were and what they need, then we were going back with, with paper prototypes. Um, and you know, one, we were, to the last point of getting people to use it, we were actually asking people, like, okay, we're going to come back in a week with the bot. Like, can you install it? Like, what's going what's gonna to get in our way? So, like, really getting people to commit, like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. Um, you know, in terms of going with multiple prototypes, we always, you know, would mix up the order in terms of what we're showing it to them, make sure to give them proper context and framing so that they're kind of in the right headspace. And then not just listen, just like the company name, not just listen to what they're saying, but watch their body language. I mean, you really like, 
we're really looking for people to be like pulling it out of our hand. Like, you know, and then at the end, once we've shown them a few, you may not even have signal to say, okay, which one was your favorite? And then often there was a pretty clear like, tell me when that one is ready. Like, put me on the list for that one. Awesome, thank you. Uh, questions? I'm right behind you. Um, I actually have two questions, so I'm gonna put them back to, get, back, to back. You can probably just rattle them off. Um, they're also not linear, so maybe a jump. What was the major like tack you took when you were doing these early paper prototype customer interviews? Like as in most something you were wrong about? And the second one was, I think you said you mentioned you went to ERA, right? Or what, was it some sort of incubator program oh, that you did? Friends of eBay. So Fri eBay in New York in their office, they like house if. Uh, so okay. Yeah, so yeah. second question is something major that you learned from that experience that you feel like was really valuable and crucial to shaping the way the company is right now. Yeah, uh, I'll do the second first. Um, I think so. One of the one thing that we took away from that is it was actually sort of a little community of maybe 10 or so startups, and we had a Slack team for all of us. So we were able to, before anybody used our bot, start using it on ourselves. Uh, and you, know, you think you know what the social interactions are gonna be like, but like, who's been introduced by a bot before? Like, so there were, there were a lot of kind of learning cycles through that process. So I think that was just having that kind of Community where you know you can fail and you can try things and get feedback. Um, the first question was, what was something you were wrong about in the beginning when you did these paper prototypes? Something you learned, something that shaped your product. Um, let me come back to that one. I, I don't have a a good paper prototype. I mean, there were lots of paper prototypes that we thought would be good ideas that nobody liked. Um, this wasn't one of them, obviously. Um, but, you know, probably like one in 10 actually people wanted to use. Um, so I, it's not really a process learning, but like we learned a ton about like, okay, that idea is not gonna work, or maybe they like that idea, but like you ask people why they like it and the reasons were really divergent and they were projecting all sorts of different things that would go into it that like weren't compatible, so. Things like that. Start you first. Hi. So, what did you use to take notes? Because I think if you interviewed hundreds of people, that gets really messy really quickly. I'm just wondering how you tackled that. Yeah. So the way we organized it, and and um, another thing I didn't say that's really important is uh, I've I've three other co-founders, so the four of us, um, we're all doing this together. Um, Two of my co-founders are engineers, but the early days we weren't writing any code yet. We were figuring out what to build, and everybody was present for the interviews, and not every person at every interview, but we were all doing the process together. Um, we always had at least two people at an interview so that one person could really focus on the dialogue with the person and the other person could take notes. Um, and they were taking notes on, on a laptop, not by hand. And then we created a Google Doc for every single interview we did. We had a spreadsheet that listed every person we interviewed and then had a bunch of sort of more quantitative things, how big their company was, what their role was, you know, did they like this or like that, and then a link to the, the Google Doc with the detailed notes. So we actually had this really robust spreadsheet that helped us look for patterns. And sometimes after, you know, interview 50, you didn't realize you should have been tracking X and you realize, oh man, that might be a really important indicator. Let's add that column and like read back through all the notes and backfill it and, and see if that's actually true. All right. um, so have you, what have been the differences you've seen in companies where this has worked well and where it hasn't or where it's maybe succeeded faster than other places acknowledging that it was built to help alleviate um, issues as companies are scaling? Um, so I think one factor is definitely level of Slack adoption. So that's, that's kind of a, a, a pretty predictive factor. There's teams that use Slack and there's teams that like use Slack, that like live and breathe it. So um, that's, 
that's probably number one because if half of your company like ignores you know DMs and Slack, the whole thing just sort of falls over because it, it, people don't pay attention to it. Um, after that, I think the rollout process of how it gets announced to the company plays a big role. So if you just sort of like throw it out there and kind of have fun with it, it's a little hit or miss. But if you're really deliberate about this is for grabbing coffee and the purpose is don't talk about work or do talk about work. I mean, people can frame it however they want and we have every end of the spectrum, but the teams that do make it a little bit more concrete and explicit what kind of the idea and the target is uh, are a little more successful. Probably time for one more. I was just wondering um, <clears throat> how you managed to get hundreds of people to use to try out your paper prototypes without ending up on Gmail spam list. Yeah, uh, a lot of hustle. I mean, the, the early, you know, the first interviews we did were people we knew in our network. And then every time you do one, you ask for three more intros. And I mean, you don't almost get three, but you just like, we, we did very, very little cold outreach. Um, it was almost all through intros and then, you know, getting into this company and getting intro to the right person there. Um, but it's, it's hard work to kind of do all that hustling and be doing, you know, 10 interviews a week, say. It's, but it, you really have to do that to get, get the data. Dan, thank you very much. Thank you.